Hi, I'm Becca, and this is my husband, Gabe. That's me. Welcome to the podcast celebrating Jack Russell Terrier Dogs. And all the joys of companionship with canines of every kind. Each week, we'll explore all the heartfelt, humbling, and hilarious stories that only dog parents can truly relate to. We're Jack Russell Parents. Happy Independence Day! Fourth of July is next week, and I've always loved the celebratory firework. Me too, but because Carson is so reactive to them, it's difficult to enjoy when they're going off in our neighborhood, and they go off a lot. A lot, right. And that's why later in this episode, we have an awesome training expert, Susan Light of Doggy Dojo, to help us navigate this holiday successfully. You'll want to take some notes so you're ready for the happy noise making. Absolutely. So speaking of loud noises, Gabe, I have a question for you. Why do dogs always bark and race to the door when the doorbell rings? It's hardly ever for them. This is me blinking at you. <laughs> is that a meme? I'm sure. Oh, okay. How about this one? It's, it's that one dude from the beer commercial. I hardly ever bark, but when I do, it's at absolutely nothing. <laughs> <laughs> that is a good one. But uh, you may be interested in learning during our pup psychology segment that dogs have very good reasons for barking. I am interested in learning that. Okay, well, here we go. On psychologytoday.com, Stanley Korn has an article entitled, What Are Dogs Trying to Say When They Bark? I'm going to keep this quick because I really want to hear what Susan has to say about the topic as well. So Stanley says that the sounds that animals use to communicate with each other are different for different species, which I think we know, right? That's pretty obvious. But within any one animal type, there seems to be some sort of fairly common or universal language, and there appears to be a universal sound code used by most animals, which I thought was really interesting. And it is based on three dimensions. The pitch of the sound, the duration of the sound, and the frequency or repetition rate of the sound. So how do these three dimensions relate to what the dog is trying to communicate? Well, the first dimension, the meaning of pitches, tells us this. A low pitch sound, such as a dog's growl, usually indicates threats, anger, and the possibility of aggression, right? They're giving you a warning. They're saying, stay away from me. Whereas a high-pitched sound means the opposite, asking to be allowed to come closer or saying that it's safe to approach them. Yeah, Carson has a really low growl. Sounds like it's coming from a big dog. It's usually when he's under the bed with something that he stole and he doesn't want to give it up. (laughs) Yes. Or I roll over onto his side of the bed. Uh, Remember the other night? (laughs) 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 Yeah. And then he has that really, really high-pitched yap. It sounds like a bear horn. When he really wants to play and you're ignoring him, he knows that when he makes that sound, you are going to get up. Or at least it works for me. It's so loud and high-pitched. I have to do what he wants because it hurts your ears. Yes. He is saying, uh, it's time to play right now. Now. Yes. The next dimension, which is the duration of the sound, So generally speaking, the longer the sound, the more likely the dog is making a conscious decision about the nature or signal of their next behavior, right? So if they're giving you this long extended growl, they're probably telling you, hey, look, I'm about to act on this warning that I'm giving you. (laughs) (laughs) That's why I'm extending the length of this warning and I'm about to do something about it. And then if the growl is a shorter burst and only held briefly, it indicates that there's an element of fear present and the dog is worried about whether it can successfully deal with what it perceives as an attack. Got it. So short growl followed by a bark means the dog is actually scared and in defense mode. Yep. And the third dimension, which is frequency, sounds that are repeated often, so at a fast rate, indicate a degree of excitement and urgency. Sounds that are spaced out or or not repeated at all usually indicate a lower level of excitement. So that makes sense. A dog giving an occasional bark or two at the window is only showing like a mild interest. And a dog barking in multiple bursts and repeating them many times a minute is signaling that they feel the situation is more important and perhaps even a potential crisis. <laughs> yeah, the other night there were cats fighting in the neighborhood and he went on offense and it was Mm -hmm. like two or three in the morning and so he had this alerting bark multiple bursts repeating over and over and those barks certainly got us out of bed 
Us? Well, you. Uh, <laughs> I knew it was cats. It wasn't someone trying to get in the house. So I didn't get out of bed. Excuse me. I had an early day at work. Anyway, but what's interesting, too, is that he went and slept in the living room yes. for the rest of the night. And he was, like, on guard. It was the cutest little he thing. He was protecting us from yeah. those cats. <laughs> <laughs> Which I was like, the cats, when they fight, that's an awful sound. It so is. I see where he's coming from. <laughs> Demonic. <laughs> so the article has more specific examples that you can check out. You can find the link on our show notes page at jackrussellparents.com slash blog. And when we get back from this commercial break, we will visit with the lovely Susan Light of Doggy Dojo. You're going to love her as much as we do. <laughs> I had an awesome puppy parent connection the other day. I was rocking my Jack Russell parents t-shirt in the grocery store and because of it, I struck up a great conversation with a lady. And not only did she think my shirt was super cute, she too had a JRT named Wags. And that's a great name. I love it when slogans like dog mom, dog dad, or Jack Russell parents bring people together. Me too. And one of my favorite prints is Jack Russell Terriers. Not a breed, a calling. Yeah, raising a JRT just might be the highest calling of all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So are you a proud puppy parent that wants to connect with other puppy parents? Or do you simply like super cute doggy attire to go with your summer shorts? Either way, we have what you need at the Jack Russell Parent Store. All our awesome prints come in a variety of t-shirts, hoodies, baby onesies, laptop sleeves, even coffee mugs. Your choice. To join the doggy squad, check out all the rad merch options at jackrussellparents.com. Simply click on shop at the top and place your order. Go get on puppy parents. We have the privilege of speaking to Susan Light, a fellow podcaster and certified dog trainer from Los Angeles, California. Hi, Susan. Hi, how are you guys? We're doing so good. <laughs> Thanks for joining us on a Friday night. So uh, how have the dogs treat you this week? I am exhausted. Uh, <laughs> crazy. Uh, but I love it. That's what I love most about my job, getting to see all the dogs. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, I bet. I know. Um, yeah. So thank you so much for joining us on a Friday <laughs> after a long work week. We really appreciate that. So it's so nice to have an expert in the house because, uh, girl, we need your help. <laughs> <laughs> oh, some barking um, Jack Russell Terriers going on? Oh, yeah. yeah, just a little bit. <laughs> we are yeah. anything but dog trainers. And, uh, yeah. you know, Carson, he's not completely out of control nowadays, but he still has a ways to go. You know, he's a good boy, but he could be a gooder boy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love that gooder boy. I'm always... <laughs> No, barking is super tough um, to deal with, especially for the small dogs, for sure. Yeah, yeah. So we're excited to get into all of that with you. But first, Susan, tell us about your experience as a dog trainer. I spent actually the last 10 years of my life tending bar in Beverly Hills. Wow. Um, I don't know if you know the, yeah, the movie Pretty Woman. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I worked at that hotel, at the Beverly Wilshire Hotel for the last 10 years. Wow. Yeah, it was definitely a fun job, but it got it got old. I mean, after doing it for a decade. Sure. And I just realized I didn't want to do that forever and be in that world forever. And I, I wanted to start doing something more positive with my life than, you know, giving people alcohol. <laughs> sure. So <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's a purpose for that. But my husband and I had been volunteering with the rescue here in Los Angeles. And I just found it so fulfilling. And I just love that environment so much that I decided I wanted to get into that world full time. So they put me in touch with the trainer that they worked with mm -hmm. um, because most rescues are paired with a trainer, which uh, is fantastic because the dogs that are rescued are probably going to need some training to be successful. Right. She spent some time with me. She was amazing. She told me all about how she had gotten her certification. She went to animal behavior college. And so uh, that's what I did. I enrolled in that uh, program and I became a certified dog trainer in 2019. 
And I was doing it on the side while I was tending bar and I was building up my business and I was planning to go full time in, it was supposed to be May 1st, 2020. Aww. And then I, I got furloughed in March uh, of 2020. So I actually got pushed into full time dogs um, a little bit early, but <laughs> I mean, what a business to be in during the pandemic. Right. We've been swamped. Wow. I bet. Yeah. I'm a firm believer that it was God putting me in the right place at the right time. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I'm really, really enjoying this career change. And I'm actually sitting for another certification, the CPDTKA this fall. Great. Oh, great. Yeah. It's an unregulated industry. So anybody can just say that they're a dog trainer and legally that's true, but it's really important to seek out people who have gotten education and continue to do continuing education. That's great. That sounds good. That's also why I started my podcast, The Doggy Dojo, because I'm the kind of person after 10 years behind the bar, I learned so much about alcohol and drinks and mixology and, you know, wine. I wanted to dig into this new field in that way. And so, um, yeah, basically, this is my excuse to call somebody up every week and and learn something new. Yeah. And I've just learned so much. It's been invaluable to me. And it's awesome that I can also recommend the episodes to my clients um, and pet parents as well. Yeah. That's great. And I think just having, you know, listened to your podcast, I can tell that you're somebody who loves to learn. And I don't know you very well, but I love that about you. <laughs> so that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think it's important to to really get it because it's like you said, you guys have had dogs, it sounds like almost your whole life, but yeah. that doesn't mean that you're equipped to deal with it. And I as well have had dogs my entire life, but it's not the same. It's not going to equip you to deal with the issues that, um, you know, people are usually seeking out a professional trainer for. Yeah. And that's why if you're looking for a trainer and the first thing they say is like, oh, I've always had dogs, so I'm great with dogs. It's like... <laughs> Okay. Okay. But, <laughs> but, you know, yeah. What education have you yeah. had? You know, what have you learned um, so that you can really advise me and be the expert? Yeah. Actually, we, so, yeah, we have yeah. a lot of experience with that. I was like, I watched TV my whole life. Let, let me, let me start on this play. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> let me, I can That's get on the so stage. True. Yeah. What other industry would you ever say that as a qualification? Well, maybe as a writer too. Like, yeah, oh, I've, I've, heard I've read that. a lot I've of books I'm, and I did cursive <laughs> in school, so I'm going to write a novel. Yeah. <laughs> It doesn't always work out. Yeah, it doesn't. But yeah, so important to uh, to seek out that education. And if you're working with a professional, just ask them. Just ask. I love it when people ask. So I'm surprised how few people do ask. A lot of people mm. go in with a lot of trust. Uh, you know, they just assume that you know what you're talking about. Hopefully you do find somebody that does and it all works out great. But also horror stories of people that worked with trainers that have done a lot of damage to people's sure. dogs. Sure. Yeah, yeah. We we have yet to, for that reason, we're so afraid of becoming a horror story. We haven't really yeah. taken to an official trainer yet. Yeah. So let me ask you this, Susan, because we're curious about this. How did you come up with the name Doggy Dojo? I was just trying to think of names for my podcast. And of course, alliterations are what you want to go for. I think they're the most catchy. Yeah. I had like a list. I should have kept it, I guess. I can't even now remember. I just, yeah, I settled on Doggy Dojo. The only Doggy Dojo I found was a doggy daycare in, I think it was in Chicago. Okay. And it was spelled... D-O-G-G-I-E, which is why I decided to spell mine with a Y. Gotcha. People do tend to spell it I-E. I've noticed I've had to correct people's spelling, <laughs> but there was a reason that I picked doggy with a Y because I wanted to differentiate from the doggy with the I-E. That's great. We assume that you're a pet parent yourself, that you actually live with dogs. Is that true or? False. Oh. So I have two Siamese cats. Oh. Yeah. Oh, okay. Interesting. I know. So- I am a rare anomaly. I was listening to some of your podcast and I heard you guys were in California at one time. We were. So I live in Los Angeles. I don't know if you were in Los Angeles. Nearby. Pretty close. Nearby, close. yeah. Okay. Yeah. I have a rent controlled apartment. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I've been here for like 10 years and they don't allow dogs. Oh. And so, you know, this was way before I became a dog trainer and I just haven't been willing to give up the rent control department. <laughs> I don't blame you, dog. I don't blame you at all. <laughs> so, you know, this is where I am. So I have two amazing Siamese cats. Um, they're the first cats I've ever had in my life. I always had dogs, um, but they're phenomenal. We got them when they were babies. My husband and I rescued them and they're 12 and 13 now. Aww. And yeah, they're just, they're wonderful. And uh, cats are easy. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Right. <laughs> 
Some, I, I mean, I adore dogs, but sometimes coming home and the cat just jumps in your lap and you're like, oh, I don't have to take you for a walk. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> yep. I find their snobbiness and independence hilariously entertaining. Yes. Yeah. They are different kind of creatures for sure. <laughs> well, we can't wait to hear your advice on a couple of topics that are clinging to our hearts like white dog hair on black sweaters, frankly, because (laughs) (laughs) the first topic being noise aversion or sensitivity, because our JRT, he barks incessantly at loud noises, like especially fireworks, thunderstorms, the trash truck. A couple of weeks ago, it started to hail and he was looking at me like, what are, what are you doing to the house? I'm like, I'm not doing it. It's just He a only picks noise. the things that he like has absolutely no control over and that he couldn't like physically stop. He'll, he'll bark at that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So our <laughs> yeah. question to you is just what are a few ways to help teach our dog or everyone else's dogs to not react so crazy to those loud noises? You need to know why the dog is barking. So when they're having this reaction, I would call it like noise reactivity, noise sensitivity, They're actually afraid, usually Mm -hmm. scared of the loud noise, right? So what you want to do is you want to deal with the fear and find some way to make them feel safe. And the way you're going to go about that depends totally on how severely afraid they are. Because if it's something where it's mild, it might be a training issue where you can use um, recordings and videos. Because again, you're talking, like you said, it's usually things you as a person don't have any more control over than the dog does. Right. You don't drive the trash <laughs> truck. You can't bring it over for a training session. Right. <laughs> <laughs> usually you're stuck using like recordings or videos or things like that um, to sort of simulate it as best as you can. And you just work to decondition them, their fear response. So find a level where they can still learn, where they're still comfortable enough that they can be aware of the sound, but not react. Mm. So if the major reaction is barking or sometimes throw a tantrum, like they just sort of start flinging their little bodies around. Yeah. Like, oh, what's going on? He's like, he comes at us like, why are you making this noise? Stop it. You're bothering me. I'm like, I, I, don't, I don't know yeah. what you're talking about. <laughs> They're just trying to create some sense of control for themselves, some sense of, you know, comfort, they're self-soothing, some naturally calming and soothing things for dogs are licking and chewing. Mm. So you can use those recordings when you give a dog like a lick mat. Okay. And then just, you're playing the recordings and then you can up the, the volume a little bit, see how they're going mm. because they're already doing this thing that's soothing. Oh. You know what I mean? So uh-huh. you want to keep them in that that perfect area where they're hearing it, they're aware of it, because otherwise, you know, it's not doing anything. Mm-hmm. Um, but they're not reacting to it. Because if we've gone too far and they react to it, we call that being over threshold. And we want to keep them sub threshold where they can still learn. Um, so that's if you, if it's a mild fear, that's the way that you want to go with that. That's great. Actually backtracking, the first thing you want to try to do is prevent it while they're a puppy through proper socialization. Mm. There's actually a really cool app called, I think, Soundproof Puppy that's made just for that. You Or you can use YouTube. You want to be introducing your, your dog to tons of noises when they're in their major socialization period, which is like two to four months generally. Okay. Um, it gets more specific than that. But basically from the time you bring them home, you need to start socializing them to people, to textures, to places, and to sounds. And so the best way to prevent those reactivity things is to just get them used to it. Because if you think about someone that like grows up near a train track, like they don't think anything of the train going by. Oh, that makes sense. Because they're just have been used to it forever. Yeah. So that's the best way. But guess what? That window is very short. <laughs> and we missed it. So <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So it's over that door. If, if you're in the place where that door is closed and it's mild, you want to do the desensitization. And then you can try calming collars and thunder shirts. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. But if it's more severe, that's the point where you're going to want to see a vet or a vet behaviorist and get some medicines involved to keep them sub threshold, especially because one of the only ways to work on a behavior is to eliminate the trigger through management. And if it's something like a thunderstorm or helicopters going over your house or things that you can't eliminate, you have to bring meds in to keep them under threshold Mm. because they're just rehearsing that fear and that anxiety. It's just going to get worse and worse and worse. Yeah. This is also interesting. And I love what you were saying about, I'm thinking of Carson, just having him lick, he has this bowl, right? We put some peanut butter in it. And he could be doing that 
prior to me introducing these sounds. So I have attempted Mm -hmm. to, while he's freaking out about the thunder, to give him peanut butter. It just makes him more angry, right? (laughs) So that's so at that point he's over threshold. It's too it's too much. Yeah. So that's a huge sign them not wanting to take food. They can't they're in that place where they can't handle it. We used to make a lot of smoothies and that blender is super loud. And <laughs> we, so, and like we did it all while he was growing up and we could still use it and he doesn't think anything, anything about like it. That. But yep. that trash truck comes, it's down on the other side of the neighborhood, but he, he hears with a coming. super hearing can hear it. <laughs> oh, yeah. We can't even hear it yet, but we know it's coming because he lets us know. So that's an instance of you accidentally socialized him to the blender. Yeah. Right. Great. <laughs> <laughs> the blender is fine. We need to bring that but, back because. Yeah. I'm still trying to shed the holiday weight here. (laughs) (laughs) Some more 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 smoothies. (laughs) Yeah. But so not being able to eat cowering, Mm -hmm. um, freezing, you know, trying to hide um, or growling and and snapping and biting at you. Those are signs that it's severe enough. You need to get to the to the vet or the vet behaviorist. Gotcha. I was out of town once on business and Rebecca calls me. She's crying and he was apparently way over threshold because she's standing mm-hmm. on top of a table Bad. crying calling me saying i don't know if i Impressive. can do this anymore oh buddy he's come a long way yeah yeah like there were those moments where we're like i don't know if we can keep him but we've pushed through and i'm so glad that we did because now most of the time he's just sweetheart but yeah that was years ago it's really confusing. And this is something that, again, I didn't understand until I studied it. But this, um, you know, crazy barking that seems so aggressive and and towards something, they're actually terrified of it. And they're, tr- I mean, not always, but most aggression and especially barking in particular, it's, they're trying to scare it away. We call it distance creating behavior. They're mm. trying to be like, get away from me. I, you know, you're scary. So mm-hmm. it's about making them feel more comfortable and more safe. And then they won't feel the need to try to chase it away. Gotcha. Wow, cool. So in the realm of making a dog feel more comfortable, and there's so much talk nowadays about CBD, even in the dog world, what's your experience with that? Yeah, CBD can be great. I'm a big fan of CBD. A couple of reasons I like it is you can get it over the counter. I think CBD is legal in all states. I know that you know, here in California, you can get anything anywhere. But I think just CBD, if it doesn't have THC, and I think you can get that anywhere. Um, But yeah, you can just go get it without a vet's prescription. So it's accessible to everybody. The side effects, if there are any, are very mild. And they usually go away if you stop giving them the CBD. It's difficult to overdose for them. And it's, it's not very dangerous to give it a try, basically. Should we get like the doggy CBDs only or any type of CBD? I mean, in theory, if you get a tincture, CBD, whether it's made for a dog or a human, is the same. You just want to make sure that uh, just like if you're giving a dog a medication like Benadryl that's been approved, you know, by your vet, you just want to make sure that the dose is correct for a dog. So, yeah, when I say it's difficult to overdose, that doesn't mean you want to just dump a bunch of CBD in their food. You definitely want to start with the smallest dose and work your way up until you see some effect. But um, yeah, it's very, it's a very accessible thing to try. And it's pretty low risk. The issues with CBD is that the products are not regulated. Mm. It's this weird thing. Uh, If it had THC in it, it would be regulated by the government. But because it's CBD, it's not. So you could buy a bottle that says it has so many milligrams of CBD in it. And it's really faith. That it's right. that the that's what's yeah. in it. So you need to choose your brand very carefully. I interviewed the founder of Vet CBD, um, and they do triple testing to prove not only that the amount of CBD that's in their label is in their product, but also that it's not contaminated, which is another thing that a lot of people don't test for. I recommend that brand to my clients, but you just have to choose your brand carefully because you could end up buying very expensive, ineffective oil or CBD product if it's not a reputable company. And what was the name again of that CBD? It's Vet CBD, and uh, Dr. Tim Shu is the veterinarian who founded it. That's the brand that I recommend. Awesome. That sounds great. Yeah. But then the other thing, and, and this is straight from his mouth as well, is that it's not a cure all and it's not a magic bullet. So it will work really well for some dogs in some situations, you know, and just like people, it's not going to work for every dog or it may not work for that specific situation. So 
Um, the goal is always to keep them under threshold, right? To keep them calm. So if you give your dog CBD and that seems to keep them calm when the trash truck goes by, cool. Right. And if it doesn't, yeah, then you want to try something else. You want to go uh, talk to your vet about, um, they have some drugs uh, that are made for dogs specifically with loud noises mm. in mind. You can ask your vet about Celio, Reconcile, and I'm going to say this wrong, Gabapentin. Sounds, yeah, maybe okay. that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so those are specifically for dogs that are dealing with uh, noise aversions. And some of them are meant to be taken situationally, like you give it to them before the fireworks start on the 4th of July or before your thunderstorm rolls in. And some are taken on a regular basis, more like anxiety medication. Okay. And they can all be used in conjunction with training. So um, to keep your dog in that sweet spot where they're not going over threshold so that they can learn to feel more safe. That sounds great. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. it absolutely does. That That's wonderful. This is all such great advice, very useful information. Like we mentioned before, our pup's reaction to these loud noises is to bark or even when the doorbell rings, right? It's mm -hmm. quite a big thing when the doorbell rings. So <laughs> what are your <laughs> top two tips to stop the dog from barking? I go back to what what's the function, right? So everything that a dog does serves a function for them. And as long as it keeps working, they're going to keep doing it. Ah. So the hardest thing about barking is you have to find out why they're doing it in order to effectively get them to stop. So you can't take a broad brush and say to stop a dog from barking, do this. Yeah. You need to find out why they're barking. And if you don't like that they're barking, you need to meet that need in another way. Oh. So yeah. Okay. So if you talk about that fearful territorial barking, when again, with loud noises, that's fearful. Uh, territorial would be maybe the doorbell, definitely when the mailman comes by. Yeah. Um, you know, th that's territorial barking. There's alarm or sometimes called alert barking, which is actually the most useful form of barking yeah. because it means they hear something outside and they want you to know about it. And then there's demand barking, which is, I call it bossy barking. And that's when they want attention. <laughs> yeah. Oh, he, he has a PhD we know that barking. in bossy barking. <laughs> yeah. That's for sure. Yeah. So bad news. Bossy barking is the hardest one to deal with. <laughs> um, uh, alar <laughs> alarm barking is the easiest. Actually, if it's true alarm barking, just acknowledging to the dog that you heard the thing. Because again, what's the function? They're literally saying, hey, hey. Did you see this guy? <laughs> Did you see him? Yeah. And if you're like, yep, yeah, I see him. <laughs> Thank you, babe. Uh, they'll stop. <laughs> They're like, okay, she saw him. It's fine. That's yeah. true alarm barking. If that didn't work, then it's not alarm barking. Then it's probably something else going on. So like I said, fearful, we talked about how to decondition. So they're not having that fear response. So that should take care of that kind of barking and territorial barking. You have to be on top of it. So one of the easiest ways because territorial barking is and this is a roundabout way to say it, but uh, do you know Secret Life of Pets? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. It has a Jack <laughs> right? Russell in it. Hello. Soup's cute, yeah. right? Part three is coming out. Is it really? I hadn't heard that. I think so, yeah. I'm excited. So my husband and I are past members at Universal Studios Hollywood. Oh, cool. And they just opened a Secret Life of Pets ride. Oh, we might have to move back to California now. <laughs> you should at least come by and visit. Um, but like you go through the ride or you're like waiting in the line and you're going through their apartment and they start barking at the mailman and they're like, Arr! and then they come back and they talk to us more and they're like, sorry, if we don't bark at him, he will stay here all day. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, I, and I was like, oh my God, they got that right. That's exactly <laughs> what dogs are thinking. Oh, wow. So. Yeah. So the problem with the territorial barking is that when they're barking to try to protect their territory and things are going to come and go naturally, it's just reinforcing it. They're like, it worked. Right. Yes. Ah. I got them away. And so you really have to manage it in a way where, I mean, the easiest thing is just block their access to seeing those things coming to their territory. So leaving a dog alone in a yard all day is probably just teaching them to bark. Right. Because they're going to bark at everything that goes by, every squirrel that comes by, every bird, every neighbor. So I, another thing is a dog that can look out the window. Now, again, I don't mind letting the dogs look out the window, especially if they're not a big barker. But if they're looking out the window all day and quote unquote, in their mind, chasing these things away with their barking, yeah, 
it's just going to reinforce it, reinforce it, reinforce it. It works, it works, it works. I'm going to keep doing it. That is so insightful because my office has a window out to the front and that's exactly where he goes the minute he hears that truck. <laughs> and whether the blinds are open or shut, he finds his way through them to look. Yeah. That's exactly what he's doing. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and he's chasing it away for you or him. Yeah. And yeah. then he's probably when it leaves, he's like, ah, job well done. I'm going to go back and sit down now. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So the easiest way is to just block access to these things, um, which can mean literally blocking uh, the windows with like films mm -hmm. um, so that you can still get the light, but they can't see out. It's a little easier with shorter dogs. You don't have to block as much <laughs> as you do with big dogs. And sometimes you even have to block the sound. So playing white noise or things yeah. um, so that they can't hear it because they're uh -huh. not just visual creatures. Obviously, we know that, right? That's one of the easiest ways to deal with the territorial barking. Um, but if you're there, you need to interrupt it. And you basically, you interrupt it. And much the way we're going to talk about with demand barking, interrupt it. Don't let them just keep doing it and think that it's working. Okay. I see. So then we get, we get to demand barking or bossy barking and they want attention. And the reason that it's so difficult is that you need to interrupt it, but that is reinforcing it if you do it wrong right. because mm. if they want attention you come over even if you say hey be quiet they still got your attention oh yes this is our problem okay yeah so this is the only kind of barking that in theory you could ignore and let it go extinct on its own in theory <laughs> yes. uh, yeah good luck my eardrums would not good hold out good luck <laughs> yeah so i don't necessarily recommend it but the problem is a lot of people say that about parking they're like oh just ignore them and they'll stop barking and it's like this is the only one that that might be true but it, it, i wouldn't go that route yeah. at all so you need to interrupt it you just need to be careful about the way you do the timing is very very important because again you want to reinforce them being quiet not you coming over and telling them to be quiet okay yeah it's a little tricky it's a little tricky so you want to teach your dog the command quiet and this sounds weird it's going to sound like you're giving them treats for barking so when they start barking you're going to like drop some treats from the sky okay just like oh that was weird wow. <laughs> Don't look at them because you're not giving them attention, right? Right. Guess what they can't do while they're eating that treat? Can't bark. In that moment, you say quiet. And that's how we're going to start to teach them what that means. And I know that sounds weird, but it's just the same way that we teach them what sit means. We put them in a sit and we say sit mm -hmm. so that they learn that that's what we're talking about. So the same thing, we have to create the quiet before we can say quiet. Right. So wow, they're eating that tree. So weird that that fell from the sky. <laughs> Quiet. <laughs> Try to spread out little seconds in between the treats, right? Quiet, beat. Mm. Still quiet, they still okay. get the treat. Still quiet, still get a treat. And then lengthening it, lengthening, lengthening it. So that's how we work on quiet. I can't wait to try that. That's awesome. And then it, once you've done that a couple of times, you should sort of like once you've done sit enough times, you should be able to ask them to sit. And if they know what it means, they'll do it. You can test it by while they're barking. Don't look at them. Don't look at the, your dog when it's barking, demand barking. Just say quiet. And if they're quiet, wow, here comes your treat, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you know, what? and if that doesn't work, I'm just going to get them a little bell to ring, you know, like we're on Downton Abbey. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. you> <laughs> hey, I teach dogs to read bells all the time. So the same thing with the territorial barking is you would you would interrupt them and, and get them quiet and try to keep them quiet until that thing leaves on its own so that they realize like, oh, I didn't I didn't bark and it's still left. Absolutely. Yeah. Like I said before, I really can't wait to try it. I think that's going to be really effective because I've tried telling him to be quiet and hand him a treat. Yeah. Right. So then I think I have been rewarding the barking. And so, yeah, yeah. Yeah. He's like, if I come over and bark at mom, she gives me a treat. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's exactly yeah. Right. Quiet is one alternate behavior that we can teach, mm -hmm. but we can teach them other ones instead of barking as well. We can teach settle on a mat, mm -hmm. um, go to bed, or I like to teach just like a more polite way to ask for attention, like a nose bonk or um, chin rest. Oh, yeah. So that's another thing where if they're barking, you can ask them for that behavior instead 
And if they have this, you know, more polite way to ask for attention, or again, if you can't give them that attention, say, oh, I can't right now, you know, go settle or go to bed, just an alternate behavior that's, that's not barking. That's great. Those are awesome ideas. So if there's one thing you can impart to our audience, uh, the, our fellow puppy parents about your brand, what is the one thing you'd want them to take away? My training method is just positive, reward-based, science-based, trying to open the lines of communication. We just misunderstand each other sometimes. Yeah. Like the dog is trying to tell you what they want and you're trying to tell them what, or what you want and everybody's just frustrated. And if we just had the callers from up... <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, right. You know, they could talk to us. That'd be great. That'd be great. But in the meantime, yeah, we try, we try to do our best. So sometimes it's just about opening those lines of communication, which can be a really beautiful thing. That's wonderful. So Susan, how can listeners connect with you about your training services? Sure. I'm on Instagram at Susan Light LA. And uh, my website is www.doggydojopodcast.com and it's D O G G Y mm-hmm. <laughs> dojo podcast.com. And uh, I'm local in Los Angeles if people are looking for in persons, but I can also do virtual sessions as well. Aloha Mama Apparel wants to spread the spirit of Aloha. Genesis Beloth, the creator of Aloha Mama Apparel, was born on the mainland and resides in Southern California. But she cherishes her Hawaiian culture and honors the half of her family that lives on the island. She loves being a mama and a designer. At Aloha Mama, they know being a mama is hard work, but it's the best work. That's why they style mamas and kiddos in apparel that is bright and filled with beachy vibes. For the cutest casual attire celebrating the spirit of Aloha, go to shopalohamama.com. That's shop, A-L-O-H-A-M-A-M-A.com. Shopalohamama.com. To wrap things up, we always like to do a zoomies round because our dog is zoomerific. <laughs> so we want to, as a nod to him, we're going to do a zoomies round of questions. Are you ready? Sure. I'm ready. What is your favorite trick to train? Oh, I think the chin rest. I like that one. I, it's I wanna, very, yeah, it's yeah. super useful. What's your best karate move? Oh, no. <laughs> I should have expected this one, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I have no kar- I have no karate moves. Um, my sister has a karate trophy uh, that she won with like the long stick that I don't even know the name of it. Um, <laughs> cool. <laughs> I don't know. What- I'm embarrassed so your karate to say, move would to get that but, trophy um, and no. throw it at somebody. That's that's your karate move. Yeah. <laughs> okay. My karate move is to okay. run fast <laughs> okay. away. That's a good move. Um, because <laughs> all right, yeah. <laughs> do you prefer regular mustard or Dijon? Mm, Dijon or horseradish mustard? Ooh, okay. yeah. This question uh, we've already answered. Actually, have you ever been a cat person? <laughs> you are a cat person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, both. I'm bipetual. I've heard ah, people say. Bipetual. Oh, okay. What's your favorite household chore? Oh, um. None. <laughs> no, cooking, I guess. <laughs> I like I do enjoy cooking. Um, uh, I cook and my husband does the dishes, so oh, it works perfect out really well for me. What's your favorite thing to cook? Okay, I just made shepherd's pie mm, yesterday. Nice. Um I have I have like a cookbook addiction. I have so many <laughs> cookbooks. <laughs> And and I probably only cook one or two or three things the most out of any given cookbook. Nice. But I will just, I'm like one of those weirdos. I'll sit down and like read a cookbook. Oh, yeah. Just like flip through and like drool over things. So I pre, like at the beginning of the pandemic, I was like cooking super elaborate uh, things. And it's just a fun way to kill time. You're like, I've never spent three hours making it. And suddenly you had this time, you know? Yeah, absolutely. That's so cool. So for TV, do you prefer reality TV or scripted? Scripted. Sitcom or drama? Oh, sitcom. (laughs) Thousand percent. What's your favorite sitcom? Um, I've watched Big Bang Theory probably eight times through, like all. Uh Nice. Um, I have every episode of Friends on DVD. Awesome. All right. Last Zoomies question. Team Daniel LaRusso or Team Johnny Lawrence? 
should I know who these people are? <laughs> <laughs> we figured that might be an answer. <laughs> I'm sitting here like, oh, no. <laughs> it's okay. okay. So you have some homework, Susan. You get to watch the Karate Kid. Oh, my God. My husband will kill me. <laughs> but I missed him. Okay, all four Karate Kid <laughs> movies, including the Hillary Slank one, and then all three seasons of Cobra Kai. Ironically, <laughs> I've I've seen all of them. He's made me watch all of them. And I good just man, good man. Didn't even retain their names. Oh, he's oh, gonna kill uh, me. I'm he's heartbroken. So, uh, so I'm the, I'm a Miyagi. I'm a Team Miyagi. Can I oh, be? Oh yes. Yeah. Right. yeah then that puts you on Team Daniel Larusso. Okay. Okay. All right. That's what I think. But yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. This was so much fun talking to you guys. Thank you. <laughs> you too, Susan. Oh gosh, it was so fun. And it just thanks for taking your evening to hang out with us. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Puppy parents near and far, be sure to connect with Susan at doggydojopodcast.com. We enjoyed our time with you today, and we hope that you found a nugget of information to make life on the 4th of July holiday or trash pickup day better for you and your pup. See you on Thursday for the next Zoomisode. Did you enjoy this episode? Did you learn from the content? Or did you just have a good, relatable laugh? Well, now what? It's time to subscribe, follow, keep listening, and give a positive review on the Apple Podcast app. Then share the podcast with other puppy parents. This will allow us to connect you and your friends with fun, dog-loving content week after week. Until next time, this is Becca and Gabe, the Jack Russell parents. Say bye, Carson. <laughs> We'd love to connect with you online at jackrussellparents.com or on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at JRT Podcasts. That's at JRT for Jack Russell Terrier Podcast. The Jack Russell Parents Podcast is produced by Earball Audio. Jack Russell Parents is brought to you in part by Super Chewer. From the makers of BarkBox, Super Chewer is a themed monthly delivery of toys and treats made especially for dogs who play harder and demand a challenge. Simply go to jackrussellparents.com and click the Super Chewer link to enjoy their great offers while also supporting our podcast. Mm-hmm.